Good afternoon, and welcome uh, to this uh, most important part of the whole two and, two and a half days series. Your sessions here, and welcome. <clears throat> First, my apologies. I got a very bad throat. Uh, it's not any serious, but certainly if I start coughing during the time, it does not mean that uh, I'm trying to catch attention, it <laughs> genuinely. Uh, I think it's important that we're talking today about UN Declaration of Human Rights, a Magna Carta for all humanity. We got very, I'm not going to make a speech. I'm going to see that how my other colleagues from other parts of the world behaves here. Uh, there's no repetition of uh, Indian or any other parliament here. It's a more better organized, and I'm watching that. Uh, we got very eminent panel here, three uh, personalities in this field who has uh, on their name with their contribution to the human rights. Uh, I think it is in the same order I will be asking uh, unless uh, I'm corrected uh, later on. Uh, on my left, uh, Professor Sir Nigel Rodley, uh, who is a professor of law. I'm sure he, you, everybody knows uh, him and his contribution. Uh, then Corinne will be speaking, Corinne Lennox, uh, from the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And lastly, my very dear colleague and uh, from the other house, uh, Baroness O'Neill will be speaking and contributing. I wanted to, because we're running late, wanted to leave ample time for the questions and answers, because that will make more sense. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will hold your questions once they have contributed and you made your notes. Uh, and then, uh, questions, I, 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 I don't think that uh, the time will permit us to have long speeches, but certainly uh, questions will be appreciated. <coughs> so with these few words, well, I welcome you to the House of Commons, and hopefully that you only enjoyed so far, and I'm sure you will enjoy uh, the next two days. First, let me ask uh, Professor Nigel Rodley to contribute to this debate. Professor. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sharma, Chair. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege um, and rather intimidating to be here uh, among such a gathering and, for that matter, with such a, an eminent panel. Um, but uh, I'll try and uh, cope with my jitters. Uh, I, it's interesting uh, that the title of the panel is uh, Ma uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, a Magna Carta for all humanity. Uh, I'm wondering if that isn't a gender-neutral version of what Eleanor Roosevelt herself said uh, after the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she was the uh, chair of the UN Commission on Human Rights that uh, did adopt the draft declaration before it was <coughs> adopted in the General Assembly. And uh, uh, she called it uh, uh, precisely, a Magna Carta for all mankind. Um, so uh, perhaps that inspired uh, the title that we have today. Uh, and it's certainly uh, a fitting title. Um, there's a lot of Magna Carta awareness going on right now, uh, and you're all, uh, you're all part of it. Uh, and anybody who's looked at Magna Carta will find many of its uh, original clauses either no longer valid or rather uh, parochial and irrelevant. Uh, but there are some which are still valid, literally valid as law, uh, and uh, or at least valid in the sense they were never re uh, the provisions were never repealed in each iteration uh, of the Magna Carta, uh, and uh, which still resonate today. For example, and you've probably heard it, uh, heard it already, the two 
most important provisions are clearly uh, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by the lawful judgment of his equals and by the law of the land. They knew how to write in those days. It scans beautifully, doesn't it? Um, and the next one, to no one will we sell, to no one deny or delay right or justice. Of course, it was in Latin uh, at the time. Now, compare this. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. Everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal in the determination of his rights and obligations and of any criminal charge against him. It's pretty resonant, and uh, I don't think it's difficult to suggest that there is a straight line uh, from uh, 1215 to 1948, uh, which was, uh, it was 10th of December 1948, which we now commemorate as, and celebrate as Human Rights Day, uh, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, was adopted. It's often thought that it was adopted by acclamation or something. It actually wasn't. Uh, th there was some unease about it. Eight countries abstained. Uh, the six of them were uh, the Soviet Union and their allies, uh, in the General Assembly, this is. Uh, and two of them were South Africa, uh, for obvious reasons, apartheid, and Saudi Arabia, and plus a change. The, the, there was some there's always been some misgivings in the UN about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, both, in t uh, both politically and legally. Certainly legally, uh, it was uh, felt at the time uh, to be what it said, a standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations, not per se uh, a legal instrument. Mm -hmm. Although at the same time, it was the catalogue of human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, that were referred to um, in the UN Charter provisions relating to the commitment of states to promote the observance of and protection of human rights and fundamental uh, observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. So it, there was always a little bit of that uh, uh, uncertainty uh, as to what the nature of the declaration was, uh, but. The basic idea was that it, was the first in, it would be the first instrument in an international bill of human rights, the, uh, the, the rest of the bill being uh, uh, completing the exercise with what became two international treaties, the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, to give legal for both a bit more legal form uh, to the principles contained in the Declaration and uh, also to provide some sort of system of monitoring. Interestingly, the original Magna Carta set up a committee of 25 barons to monitor the application of Magna Carta. Uh, it didn't last very long. And King John, uh, uh, a matter of days or weeks later, got the Pope to annul the Magna Carta anyway, and when it was reissued uh, by his son when he came of age, Henry III, the bit about monitoring the, uh, the role of the barons in monitoring implementation fell away. Uh, the, certainly the Declaration had no implementation system at the time, and it was left to the treaties to provide the implementation system. It's a particular honor and privilege for me to be uh, the current chair of one of those committees, the Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And for that to be the case on this 800th uh, commemoration of Magna Carta it does give me a little bit of a tingle, if I may be allowed it. Um, so the, 
we now have the, the, the treaties, the covenants. Most states are parties to them, though there are a few, including some populous ones, that aren't. Uh, China's the most obvious, especially to the covenant on civil and political rights. Um, uh, but these days, there isn't a lot of argument about the obligation on states to respect human rights, more or less as articulated in the bill generally um, as a result of the charter, uh, the charter obligations. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't always so clear. As recently as uh, 1993 with the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights, this is all the assembled delegates could manage to say about the declaration emphasizing that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which constitutes a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations, is the source of inspiration and has been the basis for the United Nations in making advances in standard setting as contained in the existing international human rights instruments, and then it refers to the two covenants. Not very resonant stuff, that, um, and intentionally, uh, uh, the, uh, there were attempts to try and put the word beacon in there, and they were beaten back. They didn't want any nice rhetoric that uh, could mobilize people to take human rights seriously. That's as recently as 1993. Uh, uh, it gets better, uh, however, in the World Summit Outcome Declaration in 2005. Uh, we get something rather more uh, fulsome. Uh, there, the assembled heads of state and government at the UN uh, recommitted ourselves to actively protecting and promoting all human rights, the rule of law and democracy, and recognize that they're interlinked, mutually reinforcing, and belong to the universal and indivisible core values and principles of the United Nations, dot, dot, dot. Next paragraph. We reaffirm the solemn commitment of our states to fulfill their obligations to promote universal respect for and observance of and protection of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for all in accordance with the Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and other instruments relating to human rights uh, and international law. It, it, it took the states so quite a while then to catch up with uh, a position that had been taken by the International Court of Justice as uh, early as uh, 19, the early 1980s. Uh, this was the case, the case of the United States against Iran uh, at the time of the seizure of, uh, in 1979, in respect of the seizure in 1979 of the uh, U.S. embassies and consulates, and uh, sometimes known as the Tehran hostages case. Uh, and one of the things the court said was, words to the effect of, I haven't got them in front of me, wrongfully to detain and hold in conditions of hardship uh, without, uh, without law or justice is a violation of the Charter of the United Nations and the basic principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's certainly putting the Declaration up on some kind of a pedestal that wouldn't normally be expected of an ordinary General Assembly resolution, which in formal terms the Declaration already was. I, I've been talking as a result of probably a professional deformation uh, about, in a way, the legal, institutional uh, impact of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But as you probably all know better than I do, that impact has been much more significant in terms of its mobilizing power uh, internationally. Others have probably already spoken um, before today about the uh, effect of Magna Carta uh, around the world uh, and its impact around the world, even when it was uh, not being taken too seriously in the UK, uh, especially in the United States of America. Uh, well, the same has been true of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It hasn't been the, the treaties that have mobilized people to uh, 
demand their human rights. It's been the Universal Declaration. It's been those broad, resonant principles of the Universal Declaration uh, around which people can make their claims for uh, a fairer uh, and more just society. Probably the one key thing that both Magna Carta uh, and Universal Declaration of Human Rights fail to spell out explicitly, but are incredibly important for implicitly, uh, and maybe I'll forgive, be forgiven for making this point, but I'm, one of my functions is also president of the International Commission of Jurists, which is, uh, has been a long leading uh, rule of law and human rights uh, international organization <coughs> of lawyers. Uh, and. And what's not mentioned but underlying it all is the notion of the rule of law. Magna Carta was ultimately about holding power to account. The power, law, power, political power, executive power was to be subject to rules, to norms, just as the ordinary people were. Power can no longer, at least according to the Charter, be wielded arbitrarily, uh, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does, this, uh, does pretty much the same thing. I'm not taking you through, I don't have time to take you through uh, all the provisions. Uh, I've, mentioned, uh, I've mentioned some which are uh, pretty important. Uh, I haven't mentioned the fundamental freedoms. Uh, I haven't mentioned the prohibition of torture, something <coughs> I've tended to be particularly involved with. Uh, uh, myself, um, but altogether that cluster of limitations on the exercise of political power is in fact rule of law writ large. Uh, and I do take the view uh, as uh, have uh, succeeding generations of international lawyers that it's impossible to think of the rule of law without human rights or human rights without the rule of law. They are inextricably linked. So yes, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has clearly had major impact in the world organization and beyond the world organization. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir, uh, for your contribution. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, arises from uh, your contribution. Now, let me ask uh, Dr. Corinne Lennox. Uh, I've got a long details about you, and I think that uh, I would rather, rather ask you to speak rather than me introducing and spending the next 10 minutes on introduction to you. Please welcome uh, uh, Dr. Lennox. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. I, I certainly don't have as distinguished as a biography as my fellow panelists, but I would like to thank the CPA UK for this invitation and to echo Professor Rodley's words that it is a great honor to have this opportunity to have a conversation with you today. My task was to look at areas in which the Universal Declaration is <coughs> deficient. And I've chosen to focus my comments on two key areas of human rights concern. The first is the rights of ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. And the second is the issue of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, both of these topics are a source of major contention and debate within <coughs> Commonwealth states and other Commonwealth states today. And importantly, they both have um, partly a legacy of British colonialism that has, that has shaped the contemporary discourses and challenges on these issues in Commonwealth states. So let me turn first to the first issue, the rights of ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. Interestingly, on the same day that the Universal Declaration was adopted in 1948, a resolution was also adopted by the General Assembly entitled The Fate of Minorities. Now that resolution decided that because of the universal nature of the declaration, the General Assembly, quote, decides not to deal in a specific provision with the question of minorities in the text of this declaration. However, the same resolution called upon the UN to undertake, quote, a study of the problem of minorities. <coughs> 
<clears throat> and the wording here, I think, is significant. Uh, it establishes the complexity and diversity of issues pertaining to minority groups. And I would argue, unfortunately, frames this as a problem issue. <clears throat> so what is the problem with minorities, and how can the Universal Declaration help to address this problem? Uh, Professor Rodley mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the chair of the drafting committee. She famously said, quote, the best solution for the problem of minorities was to encourage respect for human rights. Now, at the time, several states agree disagreed with that position. Others agreed, which is why we ha it's been excluded. Uh, amongst those advancing a particular um, <coughs> provision for minorities were Denmark, uh, the USSR, and Yugoslavia. And this eventually became fashioned as Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which reads, quote, in those states in which ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall do not be denied the right in community with the other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, or to use their own language. Now, subsequently, a, a very similar provision appears in Article 30 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And given the very wide ratification of these two core treaties, we find that there is a legally binding minority protection article in every member state of the United Nations. So how have states attempted to implement this law, and what practice do we see in Commonwealth states on minority rights? Well, firstly, the term minority itself is often contested, which creates a barrier for groups to claim minority rights. This is partly because in many states it's associated with minority right, ru white rule under colonial uh, governance, and is linked to the idea of a dominant minority group. <clears throat> In contemporary international standards, the term minority refers to non-dominant groups. In other words, ethnic, religious, or linguistic groups that are marginalized economically, socially, and or politically. And it's this marginalization that often leads to intercommunal tension and grievance that can be exploited by would-be leaders to develop into violent conflict. So it's important that we see minority rights protection as what's called an upstream conflict prevention tool. But it's also very important that we don't view minorities through the security lens only, that we don't end up securitizing the problem of minorities and seeing that solely as a threat to the state and those communities as a threat to the state. The problem of minorities is more complex than ever before as the diversity of our states continues to grow. And I think a major challenge going forward is how do we conceive of the modern state in multicultural terms? <clears throat> and the Universal Declaration has some important standards to guide us in, in shaping this, this new challenge. The first is the obvious provisions on non-discrimination, covering protected characteristics such as race, color, language, religion, and national origin. This right must be extended clearly to all rights within the Declaration, but I'll point out particularly the right to an adequate standard of living which addresses one major root cause of intercommunal tension, and that's economic marginalization. But it's important to remember that non-discrimination is only one dimension of minority rights protection. We need also to focus on protection of identity and political participation. And in both regards, the UDHR, uh, the Universal Declaration, also serves us well. So we find articles on freedom of religion, freedom of expression, that enable to people to practice their religious and linguistic identity. Article 27 recognizes the right, everyone has the right uh, to participate in cultural life. And Article 26 recognizes that education shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial, or religious groups. And then concerning political marginalization, the declaration holds that everyone has the right to take part in the government of their country, and everyone has the right of access to public service in their country. So how does this translate into legislation and policy? I've chosen to highlight three key areas. The first concerns reform of censuses and collecting disaggregated data. Many countries have been nervous about doing this for important and valid reasons. Uh, these concerns can be addressed through appropriate anonymous <coughs> data collection techniques. Interestingly, the UK stands apart from many other EU member states in collecting disaggregated data, 
which means there is a rich data to show where inequalities exist along ethnic, religious, and linguistic lines, uh, which enables us to uh, adopt policies that will be more effective in producing uh, equality and reducing inequality. I would take an example of some important work that the World Bank and Inter-American Development Bank have done in Latin America with states there to reform over the last 10 or 15 years census taking to ensure that indigenous communities and people of African descent are adequately reflected in those data connect connection uh, policies. The second area I want to look at is establishing constitutional recognition of minority groups which helps to form a sense of inclusion and a shared national identity. I would point to the constitutions of Kenya and South Africa as having uh, be, being exemplary in recognizing multiple ethnic uh, identities within the state. And at a minimum, we can expand the laws on non-discrimination to include a wider protection of identity characteristics. <clears throat> Another interesting example comes from India, where the government has gone so far as to adopt a Prevention of Atrocities Act, which aims to protect scheduled caste and scheduled tribes in particular. <clears throat> and then finally, curriculum reform. I think there's a great deal of scope within the Convention on the Rights of the Child to provide education that is supportive of building societies that accommodate diversity. Uh, the convention holds that education of the child should be directed to, quote, the child's own cultural identity, language, and values, for the national values of the country in which the child is living, and the country from which he or she may, may originate, and for civilizations different from his or her own. Let me next turn to what, for short form, we'll call LGBT rights protection. Uh, the second important uh, issue that is missing from the UDHR is discrimination on the grounds of sexual orienta orientation and gender identity. Now, of course, when the declaration was drafted, these issues were taboo, and in many countries, uh, homosexual acts were criminalized. Uh, however, the non-discrimination article in the declaration is not a closed list of protected, protected identity characteristics, meaning it can be interpreted to include other identity characteristics not specifically named. Now, violations of basic human rights for LGBT persons continues in most states, and criminal legislation remains in place in 78 countries, of which about 50% are Commonwealth member states. <clears throat> most of these laws are drawn from colonial area anti-sodomy legislation. But in some states, subsequent new laws have been uh, drafted to extend these provisions, for example, to cover sexual relations between women, as in the case of Botswana and Sri Lanka. And other states have introduced criminal legislation without a history of such laws under colonialism. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's important uh, to support that the UDH offer, the UDHR offers um, important protection for the dignity and equality of all people. And given that LGBT persons face a wide range of human rights violations, quite apart from the criminal legislation and even in the absence of such legislation, uh, the protection of basic human rights is a frame that legislators can use to help end violence and discrimination against LGBT persons while social and cultural debates continue on these issues. I have a colleague in Uganda who is a lawyer and activist on these issues, and he recommends what he calls the incremental approach, <clears throat> which is taking smaller steps towards wider aims of human rights protection and equality. And the UDHR, of course, is rich with provisions, again, that are relevant to this, this issue. Um, time is short, so I'll only mention a few. Uh, Article 3 is arguably the most important. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of persons. Uh, of person. Uh, very sadly, violence, murder, rape, and beatings are far too common experiences of LGBT persons across the globe. Arbitrary arrest and detention are also a common experience, also prohibited under the UDHR. Uh, further denial of the equal opportunities for employment, healthcare, and education are also routinely experienced by LGBT persons. <clears throat> 
So few could, w could deny that these are basic entitlements of human rights for all human beings, but how can we uh, begin to address the, these widespread violations of human rights? Well, taking the cue from my Ugandan col colleague, the incremental approach, we can focus first steps on safeguarding basic human rights, including protection from the law, from violence and impunity. A good resource for parliamentarians are the, the Jogyakarta principles, which were elaborated in 2006 by some 30 plus uh, international human rights experts, which focuses on how international human rights law can be used to um, prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, one important entry point in many cases of decriminalization has been the right to privacy, which are also guaranteed under the UDHR. Privacy protection was an important entry point for decriminalization in the UK, in Canada, and in the Bahamas. Adding a protected characteristic on gen sexual orientation and gender identity to non-discrimination provisions is another useful action. This was undertaken in the South African Constitution. Uh, this can also be inserted in other laws. For example, in Botswana, the labor law includes prohibition of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation despite wider criminalization in general. And more broadly, we can focus on protecting human rights defenders, including uh, those working on LGBT rights. One thing we see now is a worrying trend for so-called anti-propaganda laws, which are particularly targeted LGBT groups, which essentially prevent the freedom of expression to advocate for human rights protection. Uh, Nigeria and Uganda have recently adopted such laws, as has Russia and some former <coughs> Soviet states. In other countries, however, we've seen legislators rally against these laws to ensure they, they aren't passed, for example, in Hungary and Armenia. Just coming to a conclusion now. Okay, I just wanted to, to speak briefly on what has been the role of parliamentarians in, uh, in several cases. In the UK, in removing criminalization, parliamentarians were essential, also in the case of, of Canada and Australia. Interestingly, there's an important opportunity for the new government in India. A recent court case has overturned a previous decision that found uh, the anti-sodomy laws were contra uh, the Constitution, incompatible with the Constitution. The new court decision puts the issue back to Parliament for debate and decision. Uh, and it remains to see how the new government may reform these uh, provisions. So to conclude, Although the drafters of the UDHR did not see, uh, take this issue into account, they did leave space within the declaration to address future challenges for human rights protection. And consequently, it remains an important tool for safeguarding basic human rights for LGBT persons. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I do apologize to uh, say it because uh, I think that a lot of questions will come let me just ask to say Baroness O'Neill. Okay. I'm asked to talk a little bit about the relationship between parliamentary democracy and human rights. Uh, I don't think they, you know, people you remember the old song, love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage. I'm not sure whether parliamentary democracy and human rights always do. But uh, I shall be a little bit provocative. I'm not a lawyer. I'm allowed to do this. Uh, I'm, I'm a political philosopher. I think probably democracy is the fourth most important thing. Why do I say that? I say it because it has three presuppositions. If you don't have these presuppositions in place, you don't manage democracy. One of those presuppositions is very simple, it is order. It would be ridiculous for any of us to suggest that we ought to make progress with democracy in Syria just at the moment. There isn't even basic order. Now, we often use the phrase law and order, but not all order is achieved by law. Order is sometimes achieved by the fact that there are, is an executive power, harsh, uh, um, and that does not rule by law. So, taking a much narrower version of the rule of law than Nigel took, I would say the second prerequisite for democracy is to add to order the rule of law. I will give you an example of a society that had the rule of law, but certainly didn't have all the other things. 
Bismarck's Germany was no democracy. Bismarck's Germany, however, had order and it had the rule of law. And I think if one is moving towards <coughs> democracy, the rule of law and naturally thereby the institutions by which the rule of law is achieved are at most fundamental. You, if you don't have those in place, you can't have democracy because the very situation of parliamentarians <coughs> will simply be undermined without order and the rule of law. Beyond order and the rule of law, I think there's one other prerequisite for democracy, and that is what I would call the elementary rights of the person. Not the full shebang, the full list of UDHR, or the full list of the European Convention, but the elementary rights of the person. Why? For reasons you all know. If you can't speak out, if you have no freedom of speech, if you have no freedom from arbitrary arrest, from arbitrary imprisonment, you cannot act as a democratic and elected politician. So, you know, if we were starting from a bad position, the things that I think we need to get in place in sequence are order, the rule of law, the elementary rights of the person, and then we can get going on democracy. Now, once we have democracy, we can think about parliamentary institutions, which we know and we love, being used to alter and improve the situation of civic and political life, but against certain constraints. What parliamentarians cannot successfully do in the long run is to undermine the very basis of parliamentary institutions while retaining those institutions. That is why parliamentarians, in the end, in the way they legislate, have, I think, to <coughs> respect the necessary conditions for order, the necessary conditions for the rule of law, and the necessary conditions for the elementary rights of the person. As we move forward, we can get to fancier things, but I believe there's some merit, unlike Nigel, unlike uh, our eminent judge, Lord, the late Lord Bingham, uh, some merit in remembering that the rule of law isn't something into which one happily can roll everything else like parliamentary democracy and human rights. There is something much more elementary that we need, the effective rule of law with an element of non-corruption. Now, the third thing that I think is a presupposition of democracy is at least the elementary rights of the person. And I gave some examples. Um, why didn't I say the full lot of uh, UDHR rights? It's not that I think they are undesirable or unimportant, but I think that when we think about what you need actually to keep democracy in place, there are some things that are more fundamental, they're more gritty, more definite, and we need them the most of all. Uh, when you look at the list in the Universal Declaration, one of the things that uh, befell it in its early days was that people thought, oh, it's aspirational, just like the rights of man of the French Revolution, other things. The two covenants that Nigel referred to of 1966 were an attempt to make it clear that these are not just aspirational, that we can move on from uh, the Declaration to a view about how rights are res to be respected and realized, and that uh, is terribly important. What it takes to respect and realize rights uh, is a lot of different things. Those covenants of 1966 mentioned one of them, or emphasized one of them, they assigned all the duties to secure respect and realization to the state's party. I think that today, 50 years later, we have, 60 years later nearly, we have to think very hard about whether all the duties can be assigned to the state's party in a world in which borders are becoming more porous, in which the powers of states are not always adequate to secure certain goods, in which the need for securing them is widely acknowledged, but we have to realize that it may take more than the state's party. Enter, of course, international human rights law. And if I have one message, it is we should always distinguish with great clarity the human rights declaration and covenants 
from legislation that seeks to implement them. The latter is not the same as the former. It is always incomplete, always improvable, always something to be criticized. The, and one of the instruments we use to criticize it are the declaration rights themselves. I'd love to give you my arguments for th why we should take those seriously, but I'm a philosopher and I shouldn't trespass on your time. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.